How's it going, American History 2 students? This is Mr. Bell coming back at you with another video lesson. We're going to start with our warm-up, then we're going to get into Unit 5, Part 2 of American History on the Cold War, Section 5.7, focusing on the presidency of JFK and the Cuban Missile Crisis specifically. Today is day 156 of 180 of the regular school year. This is COVID-19 shutdown, day number 29, and this is your video lesson for Tuesday, May 5th, 2020. What was put into place at the end of World War II that helped lead to the Cold War? The Marshall Plan. And the Conference of Yalta, where the Marshall Plan was kind of first discussed, the Marshall Plan, part of it, it was an overall economic and military aid to Europe to prevent it from falling to communism. But it divided Germany up between the Allied powers. And when Russia refused to give up their portion of Germany in eastern Germany, it sparked the Cold War. You have the Iron Curtain speech from Churchill. You have the Berlin Wall go up, which we'll talk about today. So the answer is the Marshall Plan. Who were the main combatants in the Cold War? Russia or the Soviet Union and the United States. Who was Joseph Stalin? He was the Russian premier, the Russian leader during World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. What happened during the Bolshevik Revolution? The Tsar Nicholas II and his wife were killed and their daughters were killed and communism took over Russia. This is around the time of World War I. So the answers to these to review these warm-ups. We got four of them today. Number one is the Marshall Plan. Number two, Russia and the United States. Three, he was the leader of Russia during World War II and the beginning of the Cold War and the Bolshevik Revolution. Communism took over Russia. So that was in 1917. This is all really getting going in 45. So it took a long time for communism to kind of reach its pinnacle in Russia, but it does. So let's go ahead and get in to 5.7, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, this lesson is where I talk about JFK, and if we were in class, I'd be getting real in-depth, because I'm a nerd when it comes to Kennedy and the Kennedy family, and I do know a lot of somewhat, I would say, ancillary information, like additional information, uh, in addition to the curriculum that I like to share. Here, I'm just going to get through it and just kind of sprinkle in some of those tidbits of Kennedy stories, but I have mixed kind of the Kennedy lesson in with the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's why it's here in the Cold War. So this is, if you were looking forward to JFK, which I know a lot of y'all were, this is the lesson for you. So let's talk about JFK. He's the youngest president, second youngest president at the time to be elected to the office. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's actually the youngest. I believe he was 41 when he took office. I think Kennedy's 42. So not much of a difference there. He was somebody who was good looking. He's young. He's charismatic. He is a very captivating person. He's a great orator. He's very quotable. Uh, he is kind of a once in a generation politician. A lot of times the question is posed, is JFK just remembered as a great president because he was assassinated? I think that does add some to it, but you got to understand his presidency from 61 to 63, because he's elected in November 60, is chock full of so much key events and decisions that will impact future world events that it's a lot more consequential in those three years than some presidents are over an entire eight years or four year term. So what are the kind of key things of Kennedy's presidency, the Bay of Pigs, Berlin Wall, Cuban Missile Crisis, Space Race, and of course the infamous assassination. His dad was a believer in appeasement, so that was kind of the fear here. His dad's Joe Kennedy, and he was an appeaser, and he was an ambassador to the United Kingdom from the United States during the early stages of World War II, and he kind of agreed with what Chamberlain was doing and pushed tried to push FDR in that direction. So many people were kind of wondering, is this how Kennedy would deal with Russia the way that his father wanted to deal with Hitler? And that was definitely not the case. The Kennedy family was very wealthy. His dad bankrolled his campaign. They made most of their money off of selling illegal alcohol during the Prohibition era, and that's how they accumulated their initial fortune. So let's talk about the space race. This is one of the key components of key components of 
the Cold War. The space race starts in 1957 when the Russians launch Sputnik. It's a satellite. It's a hunk of metal into the sky. It's not really nothing as far as consequence or anything, I should say, as far as consequence. But at the same time, they get to space technically before we do. And that is frustrating to a lot of Americans. And the space race is kind of a barometer that a lot of people use to initially who's winning the cold war and it's a lot of media attention it's something that's very almost mystical in a way that is a big world conflict that's not a war that's not an economic crisis so it really captivates the nation it's covered heavily on the news and in the newspapers cosmonaut which is a russian astronaut yuri gargan orbits the earth he's the first man to do so in april april 20th Okay, now let's get to some of the U.S. stuff. Astronaut Alan Shepard becomes the first American in space, May 5th, 1961, so they actually beat us to space. Astronaut John Glenn orbits the Earth three times. So he, so once we've both kind of been in the space, the question becomes, who will be the first to get to the moon, to put a man on the moon? Now, JFK doesn't see this in his presidency, but in a famous Man to the Moon speech in September 12th of 1962, he declares that by the end of the 1960s, that we will step foot on the moon. Americans will. And in 69, when Nixon's president, September 13th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon during Nixon's presidency. I want to go back here. I don't know if I have this. Sorry, I'm skipping around. Now, one of the things that really pushed Kennedy to the presidency was a, an extremely close election. He won by like less than a percent over Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was brilliant. He was one of the most consequential vice presidents in American history. Richard Nixon was the vice president from 52 to 1960. We're going to talk a ton about him in the remainder of time we have left in this class. And he was seen as a shoe-in to be president to beat this young, democratic, liberal kid, JFK. A lot of people saw him as just a spoiled rich kid. But Kennedy barely edges him out. And the reason he does, the kind of defining factor of that is, this is the first presidential debate, debate to ever be televised. And you can look up videos seeing this debate. And people who listened to the debate on the radio thought that Nixon won. People who watched the debate on TV thought that Kennedy won. Nixon was nervous. He was licking his lips. He had a 5 o'clock shadow. He lies constantly, Nixon does, so he, he's, he, as many lies as he gets away with, it becomes clear, uh, clear and clear as his presidency moves on how much he is actually lying to the American people. All presidents do it. Nixon was just kind of infamous for doing it. And here's this cool, calm, collected, charismatic, good-looking guy, and he looks like the future, and Nixon looks like the past, and that televised debate is what pushes people to ultimately choose Kennedy over Richard Nixon, even many who voted for Eisenhower in 52 and uh, 56. The Bay of Pigs. Kennedy becomes president. He's sworn in January of uh, 61. He's elected in November of 60. And things in Cuba are becoming very, very problematic for the United States. Because a guy named Fidel Castro, if you remember post-Spanish American War, Cuba gained its independence from Spain, and there was a power vacuum. And a young, I know he doesn't look young here, but at the time he was, charismatic communist leader named Fidel Castro is able, able to take power in Cuba. He and his brother Raul orchestrate that takeover. And they quickly build up their military and the Cuban people really who want to stand up end up dead, thrown in prison, uh, family members end up going missing, things of that nature. Fidel's an awful guy. So we care about Cuba maybe more so than we do any other communist nation, probably even more than Russia. And we're very concerned with them because they're 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And the fear is they will get nuclear weapons and we will have a 
a country, a communist country, 90 miles from the United States, with nuclear capabilities to strike the East Coast, like Washington, D.C., New York, places like that. So, this is a problem. They decide, the Kennedys, uh, JFK and his brother Bobby, who's his attorney general, but is really his trusted advisor and helps him make a lot of major decisions, Bobby's a much better person than JFK. JFK, not a great person. I think he was a really good president. Bobby was a really good person who probably would have been a great president. More on that later. The plan here is to secretly send in people to assassinate Castro. So the CIA trains a group of Cubans. They land in Cuba, and they get immediately defeated by the Cuban military. They're taken in the jail. Some of them are tortured and killed. Some of them are kept there indefinitely. Many of them are mocked on TV. And ca this really infuriates Castro. And it starts this big rivalry between JFK and the young communist Cuban leader, Fidel Castro. Meanwhile, so this is a big failure for JFK. And it is seen as, oh man, this young kid's in over his head here. He has no business being president. His approval rating drops immensely. Okay, around this same time period, the Berlin Wall goes up. The United States doesn't do anything in retaliation, which is probably smart by JFK, because that would have probably provoked World War III at that moment. And... By many in the United States, it was seen as a sign of weakness that they're able to put up this massive fortification and just take over that part of Germany that the Allied forces from World War II were constantly saying they were not entitled to and did not have. We went over this in 5.6. You see the Berlin Wall divides East and West Germany, East and Western Europe even, with the Eastern part being communist, the Western part being free. You see the Soviets never gave up their chunk of Germany as like they were supposed to as part of the original Marshall Plan. Okay, to the meat of the lesson here, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Some things about JFK real quick. I said I would sprinkle these in. Uh, he notoriously cheated on his wife with several women, including Marilyn Monroe. Uh, it's, I know a lot of like fun facts about him. He had a really bad stomach. He went to the bathroom constantly. Uh, he hurt his back uh, rescuing some sailors. He fought in World War II. So he was in the Navy uh, rescuing some sailors in World War II. So he was taking constant pain injections, and he actually wore a fairly, fairly stringent back brace to help with his back pain. He loved to rock. He had a rocking chair in the Oval Office, and he rocked constantly. Okay, so on October 14, 1962, U-2 planes flying over Cuba capture photographs of missile sites that look to have nuclear capability. Kennedy is then tasked with trying to figure out how to de-escalate this situation. The main players here are Bobby Kennedy, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and, of course, JFK himself. The goal here is to, if any way possible, achieve a diplomatic solution to this crisis. I'm, gonna, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. I'm going to come back to Bob McNamara, McNamara and Bobby Kennedy. Two bobs there. So the response. Kennedy is flying constant reconnaissance missions. Sorry, I'm skipping around. Over Cuba. And what he sees here is that they have got in a very, very vast assortment of nuclear weapons that are not weaponized. That they're As far as nuclear capability, they have that. But they don't have a firing system in place yet. So you have Kennedy send several letters to people like Khrushchev, to people like um, Fidel Castro. And I say Khrushchev because it was the Russians who had sent the missiles to Castro and become intense allies with him post the Bay of Pigs. And this is very problematic for JFK. At one point, a reconnaissance plane is shot down. Khrushchev and Fidel Castro both claim that this was... An accident, they did not mean to shoot down this plane, and despite several generals calling for JFK to strike back at Russia and Cuba and start World War III, he decides to actually take them for their word, and the, they think it is an accident. 
So here is what happens as far as solving the situation. The situation goes on for about 13 days. So about 13 days, Americans are on edge that there's going to be an all-out nuclear war between Cuba and America, but mainly between Cuba's biggest ally and supplier of nuclear weapons, Russia. Kennedy sets up a naval blockade, and he says that as long as the Russians don't send any other missiles into Cuba, World War III can be avoided. So he sits up a blockade. He sits up about ten, about a dozen naval ships, warships, and he kind of draws a line in the sand, and here a line in the ocean, I should say, and he's, he tells Russia, he says, okay, if you cross this line, you start World War III. If you don't cross this line and you turn around and take the missiles back home, then we're at de-escalation of World War III is going to be avoided. This is a brilliant move by JFK, criticized by some of his advisors at the time. He sets up the naval blockade and puts the ball in the Russians' court. It will be the Russians that have to start World War III because they would have to try to cross the line or strike the military forces on the American side of that naval blockade. They pull up, JFK calls their bluff, and then they turn around. Thus, World War III is avoided. Think about that, folks. We were on the precipice of World War III, and this young president calls their bluff, and then we'll celebrate with a Cuban cigar. I'm going to go to Khrushchev here. Khrushchev, <coughs> excuse me, was the communist leader of Russia from 53 to 64. He's who Kennedy is dealing with during his presidency as the leader of Russia. He kind of sees Kennedy as out of his league in many ways, in many facets, and uh, Kennedy has a hard time dealing with him, but ultimately it works out when you talk about the conclusion of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Kremlin is the basically D.C. of Russia. It's in Moscow. It's where their government operates. You see the palace here, the premier palace where the Russian premier lives. The, that's where Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, lives now. So I'm going to go back to Bobby and McNamara here in a minute. But before we do, let's look at how this was solved. After the blockade works, there's a deal cut in which they will take their missiles. The Russians will take their missiles out of Cuba as long as we agree to take some outdated, not nuclear missiles, just old Jupiter uh, war missiles out of Turkey that were aimed at Russia, at the Soviet Union. That's what happens. We take our missiles out in the middle of the night in Turkey. They remove their missiles from uh, from Cuba, and World War III is averted. Let's go back here before we wrap up. Bob McNamara is the Secretary of Defense, man. He's handling ma the major military calls here. I mean, ultimately, that's the president as far as commander-in-chief is concerned. He was good under JFK, but he escalates the war in Vietnam. Now... I'm going to go back to some more JFK stuff here in a second. JFK really did not want to go to war in Vietnam. Uh, he saw it as a losing battle. He saw it as a battle that the people in Vietnam should fight rather than something that the United States should be involved in. His vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, who will become president when Kennedy's assassinated, sees that as weak and is backing down. McNamara is kind of going to go along with who he's working for. So when Kennedy is president, he is more laid back. He's not as aggressive militarily. But when Johnson becomes president, he kind of goes with the flow as far as that is concerned. I'm going to go back here to the overview of Kennedy and talk about his assassination. November 22, 1963, JFK was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. He was sniped from a book depository by, allegedly, by a man named Lee Harvey Oswald. If you watch the footage, it is very graphic. Uh, I'll leave that to you if you want to look that up. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories. Uh, one of the big roots of conspiracy theories with the Kennedy assassination is that Oswald assassinates Kennedy. Kennedy's dead once he arrives at the hospital. Linda B. Johnson sworn in. Then you have Lee Harvey Oswald go to the Dallas Fort Worth Sheriff's Office and turn himself in. Before he can 
even get into the station, a mobster named Jack Ruby assassinates him, so he was never able to answer police questions or any government questions about the assassination. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories. The CIA did it. Lyndon B. Johnson had it done. The Russians had it done. Uh, Nixon had it done, along with Hoover, is a retaliation for the loss in 60. I mean, the Warren Commission was formed. It was a multi-year, I think multi-decade commission to investigate the assassination of JFK. And they ultimately determined that it was, in fact, Lee Harvey Oswald. Of course, that was the government's decision. I'll leave you to make your own on the Kennedy assassination. So... That leaves kind of Bobby Kennedy, who is the better of the two Kennedys. He doesn't cheat on his wife. He's very devoted to his five kids and his wife, Ethel, to kind of go in his own direction. He was the attorney general, the top lawyer for the United States. But he, at post his brother's assassination, he runs for a New York Senate seat. He wins that, and then he runs for president in 1968. He's on his way to the Democratic nomination, in which it looks like, just like his brother, he will be running against Richard Nixon. And he is assassinated a few months after MLK is assassinated. Now, that will be a big, big thing when we get to the Civil Rights Movement, because Bobby, even more so than JFK, was very liberal and forward-thinking when it came to civil rights in America. After winning a big victory in the California Democratic primary on June 5, 1968, while walking through the kitchen uh, of that hotel after the victory speech, he is shot and killed. So he also reaches tragedy. It, this was a lesson that, honestly, I, so I'm looking at the clock. It took me about 20 minutes here. If we were in class with the videos that I would have shown, with the questions you would have asked, with the discussions we would have had, this probably would have been a 45-minute to an hour lesson. So in some ways it's good you get this over with, but in many ways it stinks that you guys miss out on, I think, one of the definitive lessons of American history too. So if you have any questions you want to talk more about JFK than what I discussed here, please email me at bsbell at clevelandcountyschools.org. Thank you for all your hard work during this time. Wash your hands. Stay safe.